One fine morning in the year 1836, Nassau W. Senior, who may be called the bel esprit of English economists, well known alike for his economic science and for his beautiful style, was summoned from Oxford to Manchester to learn, in the latter place, the political economy that he taught in the former. The manufacturers elected him as their champion, not only against the newly passed Factory Act, but against the still more menacing Ten Hours' Agitation. With their usual practical acuteness, they had found out that the learned professor wanted a good deal of finishing. It was this discovery that caused them to write for him. On his side the professor has embodied the lecture he received from the Manchester manufacturers, in a pamphlet entitled Letters on the Factory Act, as it affects the cotton manufacture, London, 1837. Here we find, amongst others, the following edifying passage. Under the present law, no mill in which persons under eighteen years of age are employed can be worked more than eleven and a half hours a day, that is, twelve hours for five days in the week, and nine on Saturday. Now, the following analysis will show that in a mill so worked, the whole net profit is derived from the last hour. I will suppose a manufacturer to invest one hundred thousand pounds, eighty thousand in his mill and machinery, and twenty thousand in raw material and wages. The annual return of that mill, supposing the capital to be turned once a year, and gross profits to be fifteen per cent, ought to be goods worth fifteen thousand pounds. Of this one hundred and fifteen thousand pounds, each of the twenty-three half-hours of work produces five and one hundred and fifteenths, or one twenty-third. Of these twenty-three twenty-thirds, constituting the whole one hundred and fifteen thousand pounds, Twenty, that is to say, one hundred thousand pounds out of the one hundred and fifteen, simply replace the capital. One twenty-third, or five thousand out of the one hundred and fifteen thousand, makes up for the deterioration of the mill and machinery. The remaining two twenty-thirds, that is, the last two of the twenty-three half-hours of every day, produce the net profit of ten per cent. If, therefore, prices remaining the same, the factory could be kept at work thirteen hours instead of eleven and a half, with an addition of about twenty six hundred pounds to the circulating capital, the net profit would be more than doubled. On the other hand, if the hours of working were reduced by one hour per day, prices remaining the same, the net profit would be destroyed. If they were reduced by one hour and a half, even the gross profit would be destroyed. Senior, first C, pages twelve and thirteen. We let pass such extraordinary notions as are of no importance for our purpose. For instance, the assertion that the manufacturers reckon as part of their profit, gross or net, the amount required to make good wear and tear of machinery, or, in other words, to replace a part of the capital. So, too, we pass over any question as to the accuracy of his figures. Leonard Horner has shown, in a letter to Mr. Senior, etc., London, 1837, that they are worth no more than so-called analysis. Leonard Horner was one of the factory inquiry commissioners in 1833, and inspector, or rather censor, of factories till 1859. He rendered undying service to the English working class. He carried on a lifelong contest, not only with the embittered manufacturers, but also with the cabinet, to whom the number of votes given by the masters in the lower house was a matter of far greater importance than the number of hours worked by the hands in the mill. Apart from efforts in principle, Senior's statement is confused. What he really intends to say was this. The manufacturer employs the workman for eleven and a half hours, or for twenty-three half-hours daily. As the working day, so too the working year, may be conceived to consist of eleven and one-half hours, or twenty-three half-hours, but each multiplied by the number of working days in the year. On this supposition, the twenty-three half-hours yield an annual product of one hundred and fifteen thousand pounds. One half hour yields one twenty third times one hundred and fifteen thousand. Twenty half hours yield twenty twenty thirds times one hundred and fifteen thousand equals one hundred thousand, i.e., they replace no more than the capital advanced. There remain three half hours, which yield three and three twenty thirds times one hundred and fifteen thousand equals five thousand or the gross profit. Of these three half hours, one yields one twenty third times one hundred and fifteen thousand equals five thousand, i.e., it makes up for the wear and tear of the machinery. The remaining two half-hours, i.e., the last hour, yield two twenty-thirds times one hundred and fifteen thousand, equals ten thousand, or the net profit. 
In the text, senior converts the last two-twenty-third of the product into portions of the working day itself. And the professor calls this an analysis. If giving credence to the outcries of the manufacturers, he believed that the workmen spend the best part of the day in the production, i.e., the reproduction or replacement of the value of the buildings, machinery, cotton, coal, etc., then his analysis was superfluous. His answer would simply have been, Gentlemen, if you work your mills for ten hours instead of eleven and a half, then other things being equal, the daily consumption of cotton, machinery, etc., will decrease in proportion. You gain just as much as you lose. Your work people will in future spend one hour and a half less time in reproducing, or replacing the capital that has been advanced. If, on the other hand, he did not believe them without further inquiry, but, as being an expert in such matters, deemed an analysis necessary, then he ought, in a question that is concerned exclusively with the relations of net profit to the length of the working day, before all things, to have asked the manufacturers to be careful not to lump together machinery, workshops, raw material, and labor, but to be good enough to place the constant capital, invested in buildings, machinery, raw material, etc., on one side of the account, and the capital advanced in wages on the other side. If the professor then found that in accordance with the calculation of the manufacturers, the workman replaced or reproduced his wages in two half-hours, in that case he should have continued his analysis thus. According to your figures, the workman in the last hour but one produces his wages, and in the last hour your surplus value or net profit. Now, since in equal periods he produces equal values, the produce of the last hour but one must have the same value as that of the last hour. Further, it is only while he labors that he produces any value at all, and the amount of his labor is measured by his labor time. This, you say, amounts to eleven and one-half hours a day. He employs one portion of these eleven and one-half hours in producing or replacing his wages, and the remaining portion in producing your net profit. Beyond this he does absolutely nothing. But since on your assumption his wages and the surplus value he yields are of equal value, it is clear that he produces his wages in five and three-quarters hours, and your net profit in the other five and three-quarters hours. Again, since the value of the yarn produced in two hours is equal to the sum of the values of his wages and of your net profit, the measure of the value of this yarn must be eleven and one-half working hours, of which five and three-quarters hours measure the value of the yarn produced in the last hour, but one, and five and three-quarters the value of the yarn produced in the last hour. We come now to a ticklish point. Therefore, attention. The last working hour but one is, like the first, an ordinary working hour, neither more nor less. How, then, can the spinner produce in one hour, in the shape of yarn, a value that embodies five and three-quarters hours' labor? The truth is that he performs no such miracle. The use value produced by him in one hour is a definite quantity of yarn. The value of this yarn is measured by five and three-quarters working hours, of which four and three-quarters were, without any assistance from him, previously embodied in the means of production, in the cotton, the machinery, and so on. The remaining one hour alone is added by him. Therefore, since his wages are produced in five and three-quarters hours, and the yarn produced in one hour also contains five and three-quarters hours' work, there is no witchcraft in the result, that the value created by his five and three-quarters hours' spinning is equal to the value of the product spun in one hour. You are altogether on the wrong track if you think that he loses a single moment of his working day in reproducing or replacing the values of the cotton, the machinery, and so on. On the contrary, it is because his labor converts the cotton and spindles into yarn, because he spins, that the values of the cotton and spindles go over to the yarn of their own accord. This result is owing to the quality of his labor, not to its quantity. It is true he will in one hour transfer to the yarn more value, in the shape of cotton, then he will in half an hour, but that is only because in one hour he spins up more cotton than in half an hour. You see, then, your assertion that the workman produces in the last hour but one the value of his wages, and in the last hour your net profit, amounts to no more than this, that in the yarn produced by him in two working hours, whether they are the first two or the last two hours of the working day, in that yarn there are incorporated eleven and one-half working hours, or just a whole day's work, i.e., two hours of his own work, and nine and one-half hours of other people's. And my assertion that, in the first five and three-quarters hours, he produces his wages, 
and in the last five and three quarters hours your net profit, amounts only to this, that you pay him for the former, but not for the latter. In speaking of payment of labor, instead of payment of labor power, I only talk your own slang. Now, gentlemen, if you compare the working time you pay for, with that which you do not pay for, you will find that they are to one another, as half a day is to half a day. This gives a rate of one hundred per cent, and a very pretty percentage it is. Further, there is not the least doubt that if you make you hands toil for thirteen hours instead of eleven and a half, and, as may be expected from you, treat the work done in that extra one hour and a half as pure surplus labor, then the latter will be increased from five and three quarters hours to seven and one quarters hours labor, and the rate of surplus value from one hundred per cent to one hundred twenty six and two twenty thirds per cent so that you are altogether too sanguine in expecting that by such an addition of one and a half hours to the working day, the rate will rise from one hundred to two hundred per cent and more, in other words, that it will be more than doubled. On the other hand, man's heart is a wonderful thing, especially when carried in the purse. You take too pessimist a view, when you fear that with a reduction of the hours of labor from eleven and one-half to ten, the whole of your net profit will go to the dogs. Not at all all other conditions remaining the same the surplus labor will fall from five and three quarters hours to four and three quarters hours a period that still gives a very profitable rate of surplus value namely eighty two and fourteen twenty thirds per cent but this dreadful last hour about which you have invented more stories than have the millenarians about the day of judgment is all bosh if it goes it will cost neither you your net profit nor the boys and girls whom you employ their purity of mind whenever your last hour strikes in earnest think of the oxford professor and now gentlemen farewell and may we meet again in yonder better world but not before senior invented the battle cry of the last hour in eighteen thirty six in the london economist of the fifteenth april eighteen forty eight the same cry was again raised by james wilson an economic mandarin of high standing, this time in opposition to the Ten Hours Bill. Footnote. If, on the one hand, Senior proved that the net profit of the manufacturer, the existence of the English cotton industry, and England's command of the markets of the world, depend on the last working hour, on the other hand, Dr. Andrew Ur showed that if children and young persons under eighteen of years of age instead of being kept the full twelve hours in the warm and pure moral atmosphere of the factory, are turned out an hour sooner into the heartless and frivolous outer world, they will be deprived, by idleness and vice, of all hope of salvation for their souls. Since 1848 the factory inspectors have never tired of twitting the masters with this last, this fatal hour. Thus Mr. Howell, in his report of the 21st May, 1855, had the following ingenious calculation, he quotes Senior, been correct, every cotton factory in the United Kingdom would have been working at a loss since the year 1850. Reports of the Inspector of Factories for the half-year, ending 30th April, 1855, pages 19 and 20. In the year 1848, after the passing of the Ten Hours Bill, the masters of some flax spinning mills, scattered few and far between, over the country on the borders of Dorset and Somerset, foisted a petition against the bill on to the shoulders of a few of their work people. One of the clauses of this petition is as follows. Your petitioners, as parents, conceive that an additional hour of leisure will tend more to demoralize the children than otherwise, believing that idleness is the parent of vice. On this the factory report of 31st October 1848 says, The atmosphere of the flax mills, in which the children of these virtuous and tender parents work, is so loaded with dust and fibre from the raw material that it is exceptionally unpleasant to stand even ten minutes in the spinning rooms for you are unable to do so without the most painful sensation owing to the eyes the ears the nostrils and the mouth being immediately filled by the clouds of flax dust from which there is no escape the labour itself owing to the feverish haste of the machinery demands unceasing application of skill and movement under the control of a watchfulness that never tires, and it seems somewhat hard to let parents apply the term idling to their own children, who, after allowing for meal-times, are fettered for ten whole hours to such an occupation in such an atmosphere. These children work longer than the laborers in the neighboring villages. 
such cruel talk about idleness and vice ought to be branded as the purest cant and the most shameless hypocrisy that portion of the public who about twelve years ago were struck by the assurance with which under the sanction of high authority it was publicly and most earnestly proclaimed that the whole net profit of the manufacturer flows from the labor of the last hour and that therefore the reduction of the working day by one hour would destroy his net profit that portion of the public we say will hardly believe its own eyes when it now finds that the original discovery of the virtues of the last hour has since been so far improved as to include morals as well as profit so that if the duration of the labor of children is reduced to a full ten hours their morals together with the net profits of their employers will vanish both being dependent on this last this fatal hour see reports of the inspector of factories for thirty first october eighteen forty eight page one o one the same report then gives some examples of the morality and virtue of these same pure-minded manufacturers of the tricks the artifices the cajoling the threats and the falsifications they made use of in order first to compel a few defenceless workmen to sign petitions of such a kind and then to impose them upon parliament as the petitions of a whole branch of industry or a whole country it is highly characteristic of the present status of so-called economic science that neither senior himself who at a later period to his honor be it said energetically supported the factory legislation nor his opponents from first to last have ever been able to explain the false conclusions of the original discovery they appeal to actual experience but the why and wherefore remains a mystery End note. Note. nevertheless the learned professor was not without some benefit from his journey to manchester in the letters on the factory act he makes the whole net gains including profit and interest and even something more depend upon a single unpaid hour's work of the laborer one year previously in his outlines of political economy written for the instruction of oxford students and cultivated philistines he had also discovered in opposition to ricardo's determination of value by labor that profit is derived from the labor of the capitalist and interest from his asceticism in other words from his abstinence the dodge was an old one but the word abstinence was new herr roscher translates it rightly by enfeltung some of his countrymen the browns jones and robinsons of germany not so well versed in latin as he have monk-like rendered it by Entsagung. End note. 